Bonjour tout le monde. Merci beaucoup d'être là ce matin. J'espère que vous avez passé une belle journée hier et une belle soirée. Vous avez passé une belle soirée? <rires> Montréal! Merci beaucoup d'être là pour euh, ce matin à ce panel sur l'éducation des droits humains pour construire des communautés plus inclusives. N'oubliez pas encore une fois que tout au long de la session, vous pouvez poser des questions à partir de l'application Whova ou sur le site web de Slido. Donc, dans votre salle, vous avez toutes les instructions pour savoir comment poser ces questions à partir de Whova sur un petit papier de couleur. Également, si vous avez besoin de traduction simultanée, n'oubliez pas d'avoir de prendre euh, vos, euh, votre appareil. Pour l'anglais, c'est le, le numéro 1 et le français, le numéro 2. J'aimerais également vous rappeler que, euh, et vous encourager à visiter l'exposition que, euh, que euh, Soka Kakai International a préparée dans l'entrée de l'édifice John Monson. Une autre petite euh, annonce que je voulais faire. Je, on vous invite également à prendre connaissance de la déclaration de la conférence que nous avons euh, mis dans votre sac de la conférence. Donc, c'est la déclaration officielle que nous discuterons demain lors, euh, de, la, euh, la, lors de, la, de la séance, avant la séance de clôture. Nous en discuterons et nous, euh, nous parlerons de nos engagements face à cette déclaration. Donc, maintenant, je vais laisser la parole à Julie méville deschênes qui sera notre modératrice pour cette session. Alors, vous allez rencontrer hier Mme méville deschênes lors de la session plénière, elle est l'émissaire aux droits et libertés de la personne pour le gouvernement du Québec. Merci beaucoup, Mme Mélie Deschênes. Merci. Merci. Euh, vous m'entendez bien? Oui. oui. Bon. Euh, donc, euh, alors, tout d'abord, merci d'être ici. De bon matin, samedi. Thank you for being here. It's a sign that you're extremely interested by the topic and by but what this uh, great panel will have to say. Um, donc, premièrement, je vais faire une biographie un peu plus courte euh, sur chacun de nos invités, qui sont des invités vraiment euh, de grand calibre. Et si vous voulez plus de détails sur leur bio, if you want more information on their bio, please look at the program and at your application. Donc, euh, à côté de moi, euh, tout d'abord, euh, François Crépeau, qui fut le rapporteur spécial des Nations Unies pour les droits de l'homme des migrants entre 2011 et 2017, une période extrêmement chargée pour lui, comme on le sait. Il est professeur et titulaire de la chaire Hans et Tamar Oppenheimer en droit international public à la Faculté de droit de l'Université McGill, ainsi que directeur du Centre pour les droits de la personne et le pluralisme juridique de McGill. Il détient la chaire internationale Frankie, Frankie Professor Uh, 2017-2018 pour les sciences sociales à l'Université catholique de Louvain. Je m'excuse, j'ai dit ça en anglais, mais tout ça est francophone. Ça, est Donc, <rire> c'est la difficulté du bilinguisme. <rire> Parfois, on se trompe de langue. Donc, maintenant, je passe à notre deuxième invité, Henri Tiffany, but it's Henry Tiffany. And in his case, um, I'm sorry. Yes, he's an advocate for human rights uh, with extensive experience in criminal law and acting as the executive director of People's Watch. He's been very involved in, his, in the initiation of the Institute of Human Rights Education, which has progressed into 18 states of India through partners embarking upon human rights education programs for children in school. He has also helped in the establishment of Suhan Sudantra, a rehabilitation center for victims of domestic violence and torture. And finally, but not the least, Kimberly Vance here, our third panelist. Kim Vance is the executive director and co-founder of ARC International. Formed in 2003, ARC is a non-governmental organization with UN consultative status that is based in Canada and Switzerland. ARC seeks to advance the human rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people globally, and has played a key role in the development and application of, of international human rights law in relation to sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristic. 
They also provide tools and training for human rights defenders. So thank you to be with us, with us all of you. So, thank you. Donc, euh, nous sommes en congrès depuis jeudi soir et nous examinons les différentes facettes d'un sujet extrêmement large et extrêmement porteur de l'éducation aux droits humains. Et aujourd'hui, de façon plus précise, nous allons voir comment cette éducation aux droits humains peut promouvoir des communautés plus inclu inclusives et diversifiées. Et on vise évidemment à identifier les bonnes pratiques qui peuvent renforcer l'action des gouvernements et de la société civile. On va parler théorie, mais aussi pratique, parce que c'est très important d'ancrer dans la réalité ces pratiques. Donc, vous allez tous partager votre expérience. Et sur cette question de l'inclusion, euh, je voulais euh, seulement vous raconter une anecdote personnelle. Hier, nous étions dans un atelier sur euh, l'éducation euh, aux droits humains. Et nous avions avec nous euh, trois militants, trois personnes LGBT qui étaient des militants en Afrique, en Haïti, et qui nous ont parlé de l'inclusion. Inclusion, évidemment, dans leur société, mais inclusion aussi avec nous, leurs partenaires. Parce que ça, c'est aussi une question d'attitude, et c'est extrêmement important de ne pas leur, leur, dire, leur, leur dire en leur nom euh, et de les inclure, non seulement à titre de personnes représentant des minorités sexuelles, mais à titre d'experts de leur propre pays, à titre de, de personnes qui connaissent l'économie de leur pays, la politique de leur pays. Donc, on, on s'est fait dire, évitez de mettre les gens dans des petites cases. Nous sommes des êtres humains à part entière. Donc, je voulais juste vous, vous, vous faire part de cette, de cette excellente remarque qui est que euh, les êtres humains sont des êtres complets, qui se définissent de plusieurs façons et, et qu'il euh, qui, qu ne faut pas définir en leur nom. Donc, euh, trêve de leçons, commençons les questions. Première question, euh, peut-être M. Crépeau. Donc, question un peu évidente, étant donné le thème de cet atelier, pourquoi l'éducation aux droits humains est-elle essentielle pour développer des sociétés équita équitables et inclusives? D'abord, merci de m'avoir invité. Uh, I've been asked to speak in French for the sake of linguistic balance, but I'll answer questions in English in English. Um, la, la, la première réponse, c'est que nous ne naissons pas respectueux des droits humains. Nous naissons, je pense, très égoïstes et euh, les droits humains, le respect de l'autre, euh, ça fait partie d'une un, éducation, d'un apprentissage. L'apprentissage de nos frontières à nous, des frontières des autres et comment négocier l'interaction. Nous avons tous euh, des préjugés, des stéréotypes, des peurs, des mythes à propos de l'autre, quel qu'il soit. Celui qui est différent. Nous avons tous peur de la différence. Nous avons tous peur du changement. Ça fait partie de la manière dont nous avons survécu comme espèce humaine euh, depuis des millénaires. Euh, et on a peur en particulier des minoritaires, de ceux qui sont différents. Euh, on a peur, de, on a peur de, de ceux qui menacent ce que nous croyons être notre ordre établi. Jusqu'à ce que nous rencontrions une personne qui soit différente, avec qui on commence un dialogue et qui commence à affecter, à changer nos préjugés, nos stéréotypes, nos peurs. Et c'est là que l'éducation commence. Et il y a une courbe d'apprentissage, a learning curve. Il y a une courbe d'apprentissage et ça prend du temps et, euh, et ça prend de l'énergie et ça prend de la volonté pour être capable de euh, surmonter et de transformer les stéréotypes, les peurs, les mythes qui nous habitent. Nous sommes une espèce migrante, une espèce animale migrante. Depuis 200, 250 000 ans pour notre espèce, sapiens, sapiens, et depuis plus d'un million d'années si on prend nos prédécesseurs. Euh, et ça ne va pas changer parce que depuis 400 ans, on a un principe de souveraineté territoriale avec des frontières. Donc, nous allons continuer à migrer. Il y aura des migrants. Les migrants vont venir, qu'on le veuille ou non. Ils viendront légalement ou non. Et ça, c'est quelque, euh, quelque chose que nous avons du mal à gérer. Depuis que nous sommes devenus des civilisations agricoles vers le huitième millénaire avant notre ère, 
pour le Moyen-Orient et ensuite ça s'est étendu. Depuis que nous sommes devenus des, des, des civilisations agricoles et que nous avons accumulé des richesses, ce qui était la différence avec les chasseurs-cueilleurs qui nous ont précédés, euh, nous avons peur que ceux qui n'ont pas accumulé cette richesse et qui viennent d'ailleurs nous prennent cette richesse. Ça fait partie des stéréotypes, des mythes. Nous avons peur des migrants. Le migrant est quelqu'un qui menace, qui menace notre ordre établi, qui menace notre accumulation de la richesse, euh, qui menace nos rapports de pouvoir. Et ça, c'est un apprentissage que de changer ce, cette idée que nous avons du migrant comme une menace. De, 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 de définir le migrant comme un être à part entière qui a tous les droits fondamentaux du euh, citoyen, sauf deux. En droit international des droits de l'homme, deux droits sont réservés aux citoyens. Le droit de vote et d'être élu, le droit d'entrer et de rester dans le pays. Tous les autres droits, y compris le droit à l'égalité, appartiennent à tous, citoyens étrangers sur le territoire. Et ça, c'est complètement contre-intuitif pour la plupart des gens. Si vous demandez aux gens si les étrangers ont les mêmes droits que les citoyens, on va vous répondre « ben non, évidemment, s'ils veulent des droits, ils peuvent rentrer chez eux ». Ça, c'est l'attitude la, générale. Et donc, l'éducation aux droits humains qui commence au berceau, dans nos familles, à l'école primaire, elle doit nous amener à considérer que cet autre, comme tous les autres minoritaires dans notre société, cet autre qui est le migrant, est un être qui est égal, ce que, venait, ce que disaient les, les gens dont parlait Julie à l'instant, qui, qui nous est égal et avec qui on peut rentrer en, en, en dialogue et qui ne nous menace pas a priori. Mais c'est une éducation et ça prend du temps, de l'énergie, et aujourd'hui, ça prend des programmes gouvernementaux pour s'assurer que c'est bien fait. Voilà. Merci, M. Crépeau. C'est um, quite intéressant parce que quand vous when you start from this perspective, um, our job, your job, is, is much more difficult because <laughs> there's nothing natural uh, and, and we, it has to be taught, learned, discussed probably more. Uh, Mr. Tifeng, uh, what would be your answer to this question? Uh, why is human rights education important to build equitable and inclusive communities? Well, um, let me first of all thank everyone for this opportunity to be here in your midst. Um, obviously, I will be speaking from a very Indian perspective because our examples are within India. India today is known to most of you as a very strong global power aspiring with a couple of other countries wanting a place in the UN Security Council. That is the image of India that India wants to project and I think is successfully projecting. I don't say necessarily that it is the right projection but that is what is known. But what is not known is that this large country is a country with affected by a lot of patriarchy, affected by an institution called caste which actually places people hierarchically above and below certain other <coughs> groups. And we come in a country where the gap between the rich and the poor is ever widening. The gap is really widening and worse after this whole process of globalization. It is in this context that we would like to place our own efforts in human rights education. And human rights education therefore for us was precisely to stand on the side of those in school children in school who are excluded because of the communities they come from, because of the strata of society that they come from, and human rights education was to attempt to be a leveler in the process that we were talking about. Our country is violent. We are known to be a land of Mahatma Gandhi, and that is the greatest lie we, we tell the world, <laughs> but we are violent. We are violent in our classrooms. Corporal punishment is prevalent in our classrooms. We are violent in the bedrooms. Wives are subject to this gross domestic violence at home. Our police stations, law enforcement officials are also violent. It's a very violent country. And if you want to tackle this whole phenomenon of violence in different places, then that has to start with children in schools. And that is what forced us into human rights education. Human rights education was not a choice for me. I was a very bad student. <laughs> I never occupied front seats and I see that there is nobody who is occupying front seats here. <laughs> except, except Equitas staff. <laughs> I was always a back 
backbencher. <laughs> I had very little respect for my teachers in school because our school system was very undemocratic. But then I had to face questions in our engagement in human rights where women teachers gerode me in a training program and said, the nonsense that you spoke for three days is good for others, not for us. We are teachers in schools. From morning 9 o'clock till evening 4.15, we have with children. And not one word you spoke about what we can do in schools. Are you not ashamed of yourself? I was ashamed. I was very scared because these were teachers once again asking questions in life at a later stage in my life. But it was those group of women teachers who pushed us into responding to human rights education attempts. Small exercises in the, in the, in the dream of uh, doing something in terms of human rights education. And that was the starting point. Not Elena, you are UN decade for human rights education. <laughs> <laughs> your human rights education decade was the greatest secret that the United Nations maintained for a long time. <laughs> I did not know about it. I came to know about it after three years of engagement. And that is how we moved into this experiment of human rights education in schools, with teachers, respecting the environment of the school, respecting a certain authority in the school, not wanting to challenge it. We fight authority outside. We said, in this place, it's a dangerous place. If you want entry, we don't do that. And we have started engaging in a program with nine schools in the year 1997, learned our way through with children, learned our way through with the teachers, prepared our own modules. We did not have any modules to, 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 to rely on in those days and today have moved into 18 states with almost 15,000 uh, schools engaged and several lakhs of uh, children engaged. And what we do is we have ensured that through this program, which is classroom based, we have now moved into not only classroom based because classroom based doesn't lead us. We have moved into clubs and we have found that students who are passed out are different human beings women and men outside in their communities. They are able to challenge a lot of forces of division, a lot of forces of exclusion in their own communities because all that was taught in the classroom. While they were in school, while they were in their human rights education, they got not only knowledge, they got skills, but most importantly they were told that they had to act and children acted. And because they acted while they were in school, today they act in terms of building an equitable India. Well, that's, 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 I, th I think it's a very, <laughs> very strong testimony. Thank you, Mr. Um, thank you, Mr. Tifeng. Um, um, thank you for that. Um, it, it shows how, from bottom to top, it is the way to, to, to go with human rights and how education can change things. Uh, thank you for being so open about your society and its problems. Um, it's refreshing. Uh, thanks. Um, so I will ask now um, Kimberly uh, to, uh, to answer this, uh, this same question. How, from your point of view, uh, human rights education can, can uh, foster uh, um, societies that are more equitable and more inclusive? Great. Well, I want to thank everybody also for... Uh, Showing up on a Saturday morning, I realize as you begin to explore Montreal nightlife that the morning sessions on the weekend become much more difficult. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And after Henry's comments, I'm regretting going last. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do want to pick up on uh, his comment about teachers because that, that is my background. And of course, we always feel incredibly intimidated on a panel of lawyers. Um, but uh, I'm a teacher by trade um, and uh, then moved into adult education and co-founded uh, ARC with, uh, with a lawyer. <laughs> good lawyer. Uh, a good they're, lawyer. They're always uh, useful. Yes. <laughs> um, when, uh, when I was presented with this question, I looked at the two words, equitable and diverse, and thought about what, what do those mean uh, for our communities. And so I, I will also speak from a lens of, of spending most of my adult life working uh, with uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and intersex uh, communities. Um, so diversity implies that people from multiple backgrounds are coming together. And so how does human rights education in, in our context contribute to diversity? Um, one of the really important things that human rights education has done is it's given our communities 
a language, and, and I'm going to talk about this a lot today, a literacy, a type of language to engage with other communities that, that validates some of our common experiences of violations, isolation, um, uh, you know, being pushed to the side. Um, and that's very important because um, for our communities in particular, we don't often fit the category of a visible minority. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a process of actually having to come out and be public and name yourself as part of the community. And that's a very difficult process for a lot of people. And so uh, it's a necessity to be part of a diverse community that you actually go through that process. Um, and human rights education gives us some of the tools uh, to, to engage and be part of those spaces which encourage diversity. Uh, and diverse communities. And if you look at sort of celebrations, say, of the pride movement around the world, the, the posters and the banners are about claims to rights. They're like, you know, we have equal human rights, you know. Um, so the, this is the language that has allowed people to kind of come out and claim space in society. So that's one of the tools. Um, but beyond diversity, then, we also have to work towards the equitable part of this equation. Um, and that requires a lot of understanding each other, um, figuring out who we are um, and what our common issues are, but also just understanding each other as human beings. And I think that um, concepts of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression are very difficult concepts for people to talk about, especially in many, many parts of the world. Um, we did a, a documentary um, called The Time Has Come, um, mostly aimed at a UN audience and states um, to encourage them to, to pass a resolution at the UN. Um, but in it, when we interviewed, and I'll use this specific example of Middle East, North Africa, when we were interviewing activists from that region, um, you know, the comments were, you know, we, we don't even have the tools to engage in a discussion in our societies about sexuality, period not even homosexuality, but just sexuality. We can't have those discussions. They're not the spaces to have those. So a human rights framework gives us an opportunity, uh, gives us a space to have those discussions. And in the process of human rights education, people then start to ask questions and understand um, and get towards that place of uh, a more equitable uh, society. So. It's, a, it's about the framework, it's about the opportunity for dialogue and exchange, bringing people together uh, in a common language that maybe is not threatening. And for our communities, a lot of uh, the concepts that we're dealing with are quite threatening exactly. to a lot of people. Um, and so often the way you get people together is to provide some other framework that's less threatening. And human rights education has been that framework for, for many of us. Great, thank you very much. Um, so uh, let's move to from from uh, <coughs> principles to uh, what what we do and how difficult it is. Uh, Monsieur Crépo, peut-être nous parler uh, des barrières, uh, des obstacles que vous avez rencontrés dans dans cette uh, en parlant d'éducation des droits humains. Quels sont les principaux obstacles? Euh, qui se dresse sur votre chemin et euh, si vous le voulez au même moment parler de la façon dont vous les avez euh, euh, traversés, les outils qui peuvent vous permettre de traverser cela. En tout cas, allez-y euh, vers, euh, vers les solutions si vous le pouvez aussi. Je pensais que les solutions étaient réservées à la troisième question. Exactement. Mais, 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 euh, euh, si vous voulez, on peut, comme, on peut vous, comme vous le voulez. Je voudrais, on peut commencer par les, les commençons obstacles. Commençons par les obstacles, c'est déjà bien. Je voudrais rebondir sur ce que Kim vient, dire, vient de dire. L'idée que pour obtenir le respect de leurs droits, les minoritaires dans nos sociétés doivent se faire connaître, coming out, et réclamer leurs droits, réclamer leur place. Très important. Euh, les, 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 tous les minoritaires, quels qu'ils soient dans nos sociétés, doivent se battre pour obtenir le respect de leurs droits. Les majorités n'ont jamais présenté leurs droits sur un plateau d'argent à des minoritaires. 
les minorités, et ça peut être des majorités numériques, pensons simplement aux, aux femmes, femmes et aux mouvements féministes, ont dû se battre, se battre euh, politiquement, juridiquement, socialement, dans les chambres à coucher pour pouvoir faire respecter leurs droits. Alors ça, c'est le premier point. Il faut arracher les droits à la, à la majorité. Et donc, ça demande des luttes. Dans le meilleur système politique qu'on n'a jamais inventé pour se gouverner, la démocratie électorale, les politiciens réagissent à l'incitatif électoral. L'incitatif électoral, c'est qu'il y a des citoyens, quelque part dans la société, qui vont voter en fonction d'une question qui tout d'un coup émerge. Et les politiciens réagissent très bien à ça. On l'a vu, par exemple, pour les droits de la communauté LGBT depuis 15 ans à peu près, on a vu les politiciens changer du tout au tout. De, de refus, par exemple, si, juste avant les décisions de la cour de, des cours d'appel au Canada sur le mariage gay, il n'y avait aucun parti politique en faveur du mariage gay. Tout d'un coup, les tribunaux se prononcent, et là, maintenant, on a une large majorité de politiciens. Les politiciens réagissent très bien à ça. Quand les gens se lèvent, proclament leur appartenance à la, commune, à, la, à la communauté en général et réclament leurs droits. Le problème que moi, je, auquel j'ai fait face, moi, de, je fais des recherches depuis trois décennies sur la migration, euh, le problème, c'est que les migrants ne votent pas. Les migrants ne participent pas au débat public. Les migrants n'influencent pas les politiciens. Même les meilleurs politiciens ne disent rien sur la migration parce que c'est leur meilleure option. Pensons simplement à Thomas Mulcair comme chef de l'opposition pendant quatre ans à Ottawa. Pas un mot, lui. Et c'est cho un choix stratégique. Des gens de son parti ont parlé, mais lui ne pouvait pas parce que ça lui ferait perdre des points aux prochaines élections. Ça n'a pas empêché les prochaines élections d'être malheureuse pour lui. <rire> mais mais c'est comme ça. Et il ne faut pas blâmer Thomas Mulcair. Thomas Mulcair est dans un, une, est dans un métier où il faut gagner des élections pour changer la société. Si on dit quelque chose qui nous fait perdre les élections, on va contre la logique du métier. Et donc, je ne blâme pas Thomas Mulcair, je ne blâme pas tous les bons politiciens. Je vais blâmer les mauvais politiciens qui vont utiliser la question migratoire, les stéréotypes, les peurs, pour gagner des points. Or, les migrants ne parlent pas, ne, parlent, ne participent pas au débat public, ne votent pas. Et ça, c'est le grand problème qu'ils ont comparé à d'autres communautés minoritaires dans nos sociétés. Qu'on pense simplement au Qatar, dans lequel... 90 de la population est migrante. Ce n'est pas qu'il y a des élections pour l'autre 10 il n'y en a pas. Mais 90 de la population est migrante. S'ils avaient une voix au chapitre, au plan politique, ils pourraient faire changer beaucoup de choses, mais ça ne se produit pas. Et donc, euh, on est dans la situation dans laquelle se trouvaient les femmes, il n'y a pas si longtemps que ça, mais mettons au début du siècle, c'est-à-dire que toutes les politiques pour les migrants sont faites par des sédentaires qui n'ont aucune idée de ce que c'est que la migration et qui créent des politiques migratoires, non pas pour répondre aux besoins des migrants, mais pour répondre à leurs besoins politiques de sédentaires. Ce sont des citoyens qui créent des politiques migratoires pour répondre aux besoins des citoyens et qui ne tiennent pas compte des migrants parce que les migrants ne parlent pas. Ça ne veut pas dire que les migrants n'ont pas... Et quand je parle des migrants, je ne parle pas de l'expat, l'ingénieur expat canadien euh, en Thaïlande ou ailleurs. Je parle des migrants qui sont en situation vulnérable, en situation de précarité, les travailleurs migrants temporaires, les migrants sans euh, statut, par exemple, des, qui sont une large majorité de migrants dans le monde. Euh, ces migrants-là ne participent pas au débat parce qu'au fond, leur projet migratoire est au centre de leur vie et leur grande peur, c'est de retourner chez eux les mains vides. Et donc, toute action dans la société d'accueil qui risque de les faire identifier euh, et de les menacer de détention et de déportation est un, est un nom absolu. Ils ne, ils, ils ne poseront pas de gestes qui menacent le projet migratoire. Et dans bien des cas, quand ils sont exploités, quand on ne paye pas leur salaire, quand on, leur, on les fait travailler beaucoup plus qu'on qu 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 ne le devrait, eh bien, leur stratégie, c'est « moving on ». On se tait et on continue. Ils ont énormément d'agentivité. Ils sont constamment en train de prendre des décisions. Donc, il ne faut pas dire qu'ils sont, ils sont faibles ou quoi que ce soit. Au contraire, ils prennent des décisions souvent de vie ou de mort, ou du moins de vie et de changement radical de vie, tous les jours. Mais ils ne vont pas parler sur la scène publique, ils ne vont pas participer au débat, et donc ils ne vont pas informer le débat que nous avons, nous, citoyens, 
Et ils ne vont pas nous éduquer sur le changement de nos stéréotypes, sur le changement de nos peurs, sur le changement des mythes qui nous animent. Les blagues de Marine Le Pen en France aujourd'hui sur les migrants sont les mêmes que celles de son père il y a 30 ans. Alors qu'aujourd'hui, une blague sexiste pour un politicien, ça fait mal à sa carrière. Il y a 30 ans, c'était bon pour la carrière. Aujourd'hui, ça fait mal à la carrière. Euh, pour les migrants, ça n'a pas changé. Et donc là, on a un obstacle clé. Tant que les migrants sont sans voix, tant qu'ils ne peuvent pas faire un coming out sur la scène politique et aller devant les tribunaux, parce que les, très peu de migrants vont les tri, devant les tribunaux. Si tous les migrants qui sont exploités allaient devant les tribunaux, notre système de justice s'écroulerait sous le poids. On ne serait pas capable de gérer, tout simplement. Les migrants ne vont pas devant les tribunaux parce qu'il y a un risque. Très peu. Et donc, la question, et probablement j'y répondrai plus tard parce que j'ai déjà oui, trop oui, parlé, bien sûr. comment faire pour donner une voix aux migrants? C'est ça la question. Merci. Merci d'avoir mis euh, notre, notre système électoral, notre démocratie au cœur des choses, parce qu'effectivement, quand on n'entend pas, on a l'impression que ça n'existe pas. Voilà. Et, et, et vraiment, euh, vraiment c'est un excellent, euh, excellent point que vous avez fait. Uh, Mr. Tifang, uh, uh, so what are the main obstacles uh, to this education uh, that you faced in your uh, career, in your life? Well, um, I, I, I once again want to answer this as a practitioner uh, in the field. I think uh, one of the most important uh, obstacles that we faced was that we had 25 years into Vienna today. I remember being in Vienna in 1993. And I come from a country where we don't have a national plan of action for human rights <coughs> 25 years thereafter. Pretty big obstacle. Mm -hmm. The UN decade was something that my country refused to come closer to. They never reported. Anxiously, after five years, we said there is a midterm report coming. We searched and searched and searched to see whether India had anything to say. Nothing. The decade, nothing. The World Program on Human Rights Education, phase one, nothing. Phase two, nothing. So we are left in a, in a situation where the country as a country has not come closer to the developments that have taken place in human rights education. Be it the decade, be it the, the declaration, we have not come anywhere close. I come from a country where you have modules to be created for students, but then we have 10, 15, 20 minimum languages in which it has to, to move into. So the threats before us are plenty. We had no challenges from the students. The students were the most cooperative community that we had to deal with. I don't mean university students. I mean school students. They love human rights education. Yeah. They love it because, number one, no examinations. <laughs> <laughs> they love it because they come to the classroom with a module which they have already read. They are the master of the module. The module has not been read by the teacher, but the student has read it. They love it because it deals with stories, it deals with exercises, it deals with a lot of things that happen day in and day out at home. The boy is able to remember or the girl is able to remember her own father beating her mother at home and the mother remaining silent because those stories are there. They are able to connect to their communities. Students just enjoyed the material that was there. If classes were missed, they will pressurize and get back this particular class that was missed. <laughs> if there were rains and the, the school was closed, they will come back the following day and say, we want our human rights education. They don't ask for their English. They don't ask for their mathematics. They want their human rights education to come. It was never a problem with students because this was the one class where the methodology was different. This was one class in the beginning where there was no cane. So they loved it. The teacher had to come to class without Amen. a cane. That was the greatest thing. The cane is the stick, huh? not the walking. <laughs> the challenge really was from teachers, because the teachers were expected to be different. The teachers were expected not to come to the cane. It was almost as if they were wanting to come to, asked to come to class without their shirts on. The cane is essential part of their, of their, of their clothing. The teachers found it difficult because students were allowed to ask questions in the classroom. The teachers found it difficult because they were asked to be democratic in a classroom 
which is supposed to be a non-democratic situation. Undemocracy, undemocratic classrooms are the norms in schools. And schools for the poor are most undemocratic. And you ask the teacher to be a democratic teacher, a tough exercise for the teacher. So it was the teachers whom we had the greatest challenge from. They used to love us as a person, but never used to love us for what we were engaging the, ourselves with them. The permission from the authorities was the worst. <laughs> you cannot enter school. You, 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 can, you, you can work with human rights education for lawyers. You can do it for doctors. You can do it for various other people. But this is a prison. You cannot enter the school without the authorities giving you permission. And the authorities read your modules with a magnifying glass, not even an ordinary glass. And every word is measured 50% more than what it is meant to be. I remember standing before these authorities. Six-footer like me, I used to become a four-footer in front of those authorities. And Indian authorities love you standing like this. Imagine me with my moustache, with my height, bowing in front of those authorities only because I wanted my module out. The worst module approval was on discrimination. The title was discrimination. Imagine a module titled discrimination in India. And we had a very great difficult process. And I, I can tell you stories later. I'm a little scared about Julie's timings <laughs> of how we got that module out. We got that module out with a lot of, lot of human rights activism that we had to do to ensure that that officer signed. But that was very difficult to get authorities' permission to enter schools. We had very difficult, the difficulty was, it is easy to teach human rights as a subject. But we wanted it integrated into other subjects. And if you want it integrated into other subjects, these subject experts are the worst people. Because they will never want anything to come into their English. They will never want their mathematics to be diluted. They don't want their civics to be diluted because all our content was diluting their content. So we never succeeded in integration for many years. That was a major problem. The most important problem was an activist who takes actions on the ground, who fights issues on the street. We have forgotten doing street, street fights. Eh? We love these kind of conferences. We are people who love that. Imagine suddenly having to come into classrooms, work with authorities, work with children, work with teachers. That was really very difficult. You will not believe I had to play a double game. My program was called Institute of Human Rights Education. And my organization was called People's Watch. And when we went to authorities, I would never go representing the IHRE because we tried to portray that that was somebody else. That was a different caste. This was a different caste. Until one day I got caught. I went to the authorities and they said, there's a wonderful person coming, Henry. I gave him an appointment at 12 o'clock, knowing that you're meeting me at 11.30. I said, who are they, sir? Somebody from the Institute of Human Rights Education. <laughs> I managed for four or five years with the story. It didn't continue. It was very difficult. The activism, the human rights defender, getting on to be an educator, of human rights education in schools is a tough challenge that we had to face. The West, the West, friends, and I have to say it here, the West, is that while this program was going on into 18 states with 15,000 children, my government thought it fit to close and lock down my bank accounts. It was easy for Andrew yesterday to talk about backlash. I am the victim of that backlash. I stand before you with my bank accounts closed for 1,200 days. 1,200 days, not one or two. And this brought down the program, closed down the program, as a funded program from outside. As an integrated program with the school, we managed. This was a major challenge that we never thought of looking at resources from within the country to be able to take down the program. And I think, therefore, the solution is to look for partners who have money inside the country and these are happening to be we are in a business school happily we are sitting in the business school all of you come and invest canada comes and invests in a lot of money into india we want good canadian companies to invest in a, a in a country which respects its constitution in its schools because that is where the next generation is built the new india is not built in corporate houses the new india is built in our classrooms mm -hmm. 
But for that, we need resources to teach human rights education. And corporates are, are people who give a lot of money. We are supposed to give money. I don't want them to give only money for the toilets that my prime minister wants to build. Let them also give money for the classrooms with human rights education. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Kimberly, obstacle, I'm sure you've uh, gone through a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> Please um, tell us about it. Yeah, when I saw the three questions, I thought, oh, that's the easiest one to go to first. <laughs> <laughs> I can list the obstacles very well. Um, but I do want to just pick up on something Henry said um, about teaching in the school system, because this is not unique to India. We, uh, we've heard a lot about how wonderful uh, Canada has and how, how much it's ad advanced on these issues. But I want to highlight the fact that in many provinces in Canada, um, you can um, engage in a curriculum where sexual orientation and gender identity are discussed as part of the human rights framework. But as a parent, you can remove your child from a classroom where they're actually discussing sexuality. <laughs> so, so to understand what those concepts even mean, parents have the right to remove their kids from the classroom and the curriculum when they're discussing those concepts. So it's a bit insane to, do to talk about in a human rights framework protections and identities and groups that are protected but when you're actually talking about what these concepts mean and how you can realize these things as a young person growing up you, your parents uh, have the right to remove you from those pieces of the curriculum um, so this is a problem that that uh, that we face in particular around our communities um, so I came up with three sort of main challenges. I'm sure there are many more, and there's lots of people in the room that, that can probably name more. But I've sort of clumped them as the first one being uh, colonial legacies, the second one being extreme medicalization, um, and the third being fundamentalist thinking. Um, and I'm avoiding targeting religion or religions in particular, but but the fundamentalist thinking that goes as part of some of those religions, but not the religion itself. Uh, on colonial legacies, and I'll pick up on some of the, the comments that uh, Senator Sinclair made on the first night, um, talking about how um, these legacies in Canada have, have led to erasure of language, of culture, uh, and I would even go further than what he did and say also erasure of identities uh, in, in Canada, two-spirit identities, but in many cultures around the world, legacies, are, or sorry, identities that have existed for thousands of years um, where there were very fluid forms of uh, gender expression, sexuality, um, uh, that, that um, were attempted to be erased by colonial uh, powers. And not just kind of a process of erasure, but actually, and you'll know this quite well, a legacy of criminalization uh, of those identities. And so even though, and, and, I, and I like to say this kind of uh, as kind of another insane concept, the, even though many of the countries that were colonized have really pushed away from that, declared independence, um, that they're on their own path, the one thing that they hold on to is the criminalization of sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, it, it's, it's, it's held on to even though they've rejected every other sort of legacy of those colonial times. Um, and so this is a huge challenge for us because how do you engage in human rights education uh, and talk about a population that's still criminalized? Obviously, you're not going to be allowed to go into schools to, you know, and, and actually talk about populations that are still seen as criminals. Um, the medicalization, so if we're not talking about people seen as criminals, then they're seen as sick. Um, and this is a huge issue still. Um, you know, we're, we're in debates now uh, with the World Health Assembly on how to actually sort of rework some of the definitions around um, illness um, associated with uh, trans identities in particular, um, so that, and this is the other insanity of it, so that there remains a claim to rights, but there also remains an opportunity 
to get medical assistance when necessary. And it's a hard balance, um, and it's a very difficult one. But you also don't want to deny people the opportunity to seek medical assistance when they require a kind of diagnosis. Um, and then I guess the third, the fundamentalist thinking, and this is often sort of an interesting mix-up of religion, culture, traditional values. And we see the, this a lot in our UN work where even though we're making great progress on issues of sexual orientation and gender identity, there's almost now, it's not, it's not polite anymore to actually challenge those. Like in the beginning when we started this work in 2003, it, countries made you know, no bones about the fact that they would just stand up and say, you don't have an entitlement to these human rights, period. They're more polite about it now, but <laughs> now what we're seeing is this sort of parallel trajectory of resolutions on protection of the family, uh, traditional values um, that, that absolutely set up this competition between these notions of rights. Um, and, and all of these three things, these colonial legacies, medicalization, fundamentalist thinking, contribute to um, a reality that when we talk about universality, um, that many people don't think that includes us. And so it's great to have this kind of umbrella of universality, but uh, for many of us it's been important to add a layer of specificity to that. And it's been necessary, unfortunately. Uh, and one of the big projects that I'll talk about in our next question is the development of these set of principles called the Joke Jakarta Principles, which we've worked very hard on. Um, because you would think that a convention on torture that says no person shall be tortured should include everybody, but it doesn't. A lot of countries don't consider LGBT people as people, as humans. Um, and so part of the challenge to education for us has been to actually humanize the population to allow them to kind of become comfortable with the idea that we are actually human beings um, and that when we talk about universality of rights, we're part of that equation of universality. Um, so, so these are some of the, the challenges that we work with. Thank you. Huge, huge mm -hmm. challenges, yeah. really. Yeah. And, and you're right about fundamentalism and, and culture, you know. Mm -hmm. It has been summarized, this, this debate, as a north-south debate, as a mm -hmm. culture debate, mm -hmm. uh, which it is not. It's all reasons for not acting. Well, and, and in and fact, there's a lot of churches from the West, from in particular Canada and the United States, that send people all around the world to educate educate those countries on how to protect them from the evils of homosexuality or develop laws, criminalize, new criminalizing laws, um, uh, you know, when they know they can't get away with that in North America. They, they go south. But they will go and do it elsewhere. Well, that's very difficult. Thank mm. you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so now, approaches, solutions, um, since we want to, to have uh, lots of time for questions, uh, please um, um, restrain yourself. I know it's difficult. I know you have a lot to say. Uh, what can you say to help uh, everybody here? Um, D'abord, uh, Monsieur Crépeau, uh, comment, comment aller vers l'avant, comment avoir des solutions, des approches qui nous permettent uh, d'avoir de l'espoir et de continuer? Merci. Um, je rebondis à nouveau sur ce que Kim vient de dire. Humanize the population. Migrants, no, pardon, je, je parle français. Les, les migrants ne sont pas des personnes humaines. Les migrants sont des outils économiques on a dont on a besoin maintenant et qu'on peut jeter après. Et nous, citoyens, on trouve très intéressant que nos fraises soient pas chères au mois de juin et on se fiche complètement de savoir euh, qu'elles ont été ramassées par des personnes qui sont parfaitement exploitées, et c'est ce qui explique le coût du, du casseau de fraises à 2 ou 3 dollars au mois de juin. Donc, il faut faire parler les migrants, comme il a fallu faire parler la communauté LGBT, comme il faut faire parler les castes qui sont discriminées, il faut faire parler les migrants, il faut leur faire raconter leur histoire, « empower them to speak up » en anglais, um, de manière à ce qu'ils puissent transformer cette image. La peur que nous avons, nous, comme sédentaires, parce qu'on a oublié que, en fait, dans notre famille, et ça, si je pose la question, tiens, je vais poser la question, c'est intéressant. 
qui, dans cette salle, habite dans la ville de naissance de ses quatre grands-parents? Pensez-y, là. Who lives in the, in the city of birth of your four grandparents? One person there? Is there another hand? Deux? Voilà. C'est la proportion qu'on a. Nous sommes migrants par génération et on ne s'en rend pas compte. Nous avons une expérience migratoire à moins de deux générations et il faut ramener ça dans notre narratif familial, mais aussi le narratif euh, social et le narratif national. Alors, parce qu'on a peur des personnes qui sont... On est des sédentaires, on accumule, on est riche. On a peur des gens qui sont sans feu ni lieu, qui sont nomades, qui n'ont rien à perdre. Et c'est ça l'image que renvoie le migrant. Il n'a rien à perdre. C'est pour ça qu'on en fait un criminel. C'est pour ça que le président euh, Trump, euh, tous, les tous les trois matins, tweet quelque chose à propos de tous ces criminels qui veulent passer la frontière. C'est l'image qu'on envoie. Et donc, il faut leur permettre de raconter leur histoire. Et il y a des tas de moyens de le faire. Il y a des tas de moyens de le faire, mais chacun d'entre nous, dans nos différents milieux, il faut qu'on prenne la responsabilité de commencer la conversation. Alors, je te donne un exemple. Dans l'administration publique, il y, a une, il y a un gros effort de, de, de sensibilisation, d'éducation à faire dans l'administration publique. Il faut que les gouvernements se rendent compte que les migrants qui sont en situation de précarité n'iront pas à l'hôpital pour faire soigner leurs enfants si l'hôpital va les dénoncer à euh, l'Agence canadienne des services de, de, de frontières. Euh, ils n'iront pas à la police quand il y a de la violence familiale ou quand il y a de, des, le, des, des coups de feu chez le voisin. Euh, ils n'iront pas se plaindre à l'inspecteur du travail si l'inspecteur du travail va les dénoncer à l'immigration. Donc, il faut un espace dans l'administration publique, et ça, ça s'appelle des pare-feux, firewalls. Il faut créer des pare-feux entre les administrations publiques qui ont une mission à remplir, la santé publique, l'éducation pour tous, la protection, pro, serve and protect, la protection de tous, et, euh, et qui se voient empêchés de remplir cette mission parce qu'on leur donne des fonctions d'immigration. En Angleterre, on a demandé à tous les propriétaires d'appartements de vérifier le statut migratoire de leurs locataires. On demande maintenant à toutes les banques de vérifier le statut migratoire de leurs clients. C'est exactement le contraire de ce qu'il faut faire parce qu'on les envoie encore plus profondément dans la clandestinité. Donc, c'est très important d'avoir des firewalls. Mais pour ça, il faut avoir des fonctionnaires qui comprennent de quoi il s'agit. Il faut avoir des politiciens qui sont prêts à introduire ces firewalls. Et il y en a. Je donne exemple, un exemple. La, le, les services de police de beaucoup de villes aux États-Unis, dont San Francisco, pas étonnant, euh, ont demandé à la ville de leur interdire de, de contrôler les papiers d'immigration, de manière à créer une relation de confiance avec tous les citoyens de la ville, de manière à ce qu'ils puissent dénoncer la violence, le crime à la police sans avoir peur d'être arrêtés et expulsés. Et ça, c'est une éducation. Et c'est une éducation pour les policiers, c'est une éducation pour les gens du conseil de ville, et c'est une éducation pour les citoyens. D'avoir peur d'être arrêté parce qu'on a raté un stop, euh, parce qu'on risque de se faire renvoyer du pays, c'est absurde. Et pourtant, c'est ce, ce que vivent de nombreux migrants. Ça, c'est un exemple. Mais il faut éduquer les, les avocats et les juges sur la protection des migrants. Nous avons une tendance dans tous nos pays à mettre les migrants en prison, en détention, pour des semaines, des mois, des années. Et nous, les citoyens, on dit « Ah, ben il a dû faire quelque chose, ça doit être normal. » Et on ne se préoccupe pas de savoir ce qui se passe. Si nos enfants étaient détenus comme les migrants sont détenus quand ils arrivent dans nos pays, on serait horrifiés, on hurlerait, on irait voir le premier ministre, les ministres, etc. Mais si c'est des migrants, on se dit « Ah, ben c'est des migrants, euh, peut-être que c'est normal, peut-être que ça doit être comme ça. Et donc, il y a un travail à faire pour éduquer toute la communauté juridique au fait que les migrants ont, les mêmes ont le même droit à la liberté que toute autre personne dans notre société. Euh, les syndicats, les droits au travail. Alors, les syndicats étaient très craintifs de protéger les travailleurs migrants parce que c'était la compétition pour leurs membres. Aujourd'hui, les syndicats ont commencé à se rendre compte que ce sont de futurs membres. 
et que, que les migrants, particulièrement les migrants en situation irrégulière, mais aussi les travailleurs migrants temporaires, sont souvent dans la même situation que le prolétariat urbain du 19e siècle pour lequel les syndicats ont été créés. Et donc, ils se rendent compte que ça fait partie de leur mission. Et on le voit, par exemple, dans le secteur agricole, les syndicats commencent à agir en faveur des travailleurs agricoles, même sans statut. Et ça aussi, c'est une éducation. Ça ne se passe pas encore dans la construction. Il va falloir qu'on réfléchisse à ça. Euh, les, les ONG, les, les faith-based organizations sont très bonnes et elles font un travail formidable. Il faut continuer à les encourager. Les artistes, regardez le nombre de romans et de films qui sortent sur la diversité, la mobilité, à commencer, pour ceux qui sont plus vieux parmi vous, par Star Trek des années 60. C'était sur la mobilité et la diversité. Ça nous annonçait déjà quelque chose. Euh, les médias. Les médias, c'est extrêmement important que les médias se racontent les histoires et racontent les histoires des migrants. Et au cours de mon mandat, en 2011 et 2017, j'ai vu une différence extraordinaire. Je commence en 2011 et la plupart des journalistes interviewent le ministre et reproduisent le discours du ministre. Mais grâce aux, aux crises européennes, évidemment, en tant que ça se passait dans le sud, euh, ça n'avait ça aucun écho dans le New York Times ou dans la presse ou ailleurs, mais, mais quand c'est passé en Europe, là, tout d'un coup, il y a eu un intérêt. C'est devenu global, hein, parce que c'est européen, c'est global. Donc, euh, là, tout d'un coup, les, les médias ont eu un intérêt. Et on a maintenant un immigration correspondant au New York Times. Et on a de vraies histoires. Et on a des journalistes qui interviewent des gens à Idomeni, qui interviewent des gens à Lampedusa, qui interviewent des gens dans la Andaman Sea, et qui interviewent des Rohingyas. Et ça, ça change la perception de tout le monde. Et ça fait partie de notre human rights education. Et je veux dire qu'au niveau des Nations unies et des pays, il y a un énorme travail à faire sur les politiques migratoires. Il faut qu'on éduque les pays sur la détention, sur les arrestations, sur les humiliations, sur le respect du droit du travail pour tous les travailleurs. Ça, ça ne se fait pas. Travail Québec, juste pour donner cet exemple-là, Travail Québec participe à dénoncer les migrants, les travailleurs migrants qui sont sans papier. Ce qui veut dire que Travail Québec ne fait pas sa job de protéger les, tous les travailleurs et de faire respecter les lois du travail, euh, le droit du travail chez les, dans, les, dans les entreprises québécoises. Et ça, pour moi, ça fait partie. Il y a des silver linings, et le silver lining, c'est la jeunesse, je trouve, dans beaucoup de pays, qui fait beaucoup moins de distinctions par rapport à leurs amis d'une couleur, d'une religion, d'une société, d'une tradition différente, que moi, j'en faisais dans mon école primaire à Montréal dans les années 60. Mer mer merci. <rires> je m'excuse, j'ai l'ingrat tâche mais non, de... Mais de, de euh, je peux continuer pendant des heures. <rires> euh, Henri, monsieur, monsieur Tiffany, donc, euh, solutions, what to do, how to do it, to, 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 to succeed, to, 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 to do, not to succeed, but to make progress, I should say. Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to also clarify that um, the schools that we are engaged in largely are the schools run by the government. Uh, and it is not the private schools in India. So the children who access these schools are therefore not the privileged. Mm -hmm. These are the most vulnerable citizens of society. And the choice that we made was not that we are against private schools at all, but the choice that we made was we have to make this model replicable. And if it has to be replicable, it has to be replicated through the government schools. And therefore, that is the choice. And I think I need to bring this framework uh, for people to appreciate. Um, in terms of methodology, I, 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 I think this is the time for us to acknowledge that we were looking for methodology. And the answer for methodology came from Canada. Canada, Equitas? It was Equitas. <laughs> and I think we need to acknowledge that. There are not many of us who acknowledge uh, methodology. And uh, Equitas can stand upside down for methodology. I, <laughs> I go through their manuals every year to find change. And every year, these people sitting in, in Equitas office have something of a change in their next module. That brought in a very participatory approach in terms of handling the teachers. And teachers today, after 10 years, 15 years, only remember the participatory process that they were subjected to. And that became the core content. And I think that was a very strong tool in terms of uh, handling human rights. 
human rights cannot be lectured to people, yes. especially teachers. If you deal with them with a methodology where they participate, I think they become your partners. And I want to give you an example. It is not a joke. There was a boy who today is, is, is a teacher himself. Uh, a boy who was known to, to Elena, who complained to Elena when she came to, to India to look at these 1,500 or 2,000 students who were there. He went and complained to her saying, I want you to take action against this tall man who is standing next to you. Because he stopped human rights education after class 8. He allowed us to do human rights education in five, 6, 7 and 8. I am now in 9th standard and he stopped. He did not know that the person who was translating to Elena was in, in English from, from Tamil was my own wife. <laughs> he was complaining. But this boy, when he was in a classroom, on, when he was in, a, in, a, in his village in a Saturday, playing, he saw an old lady cursing the daughter-in-law in the house, saying that she had to kill this child whom she had given birth to, the girl child that she had given birth to. The boy was shocked. He runs up to this old lady, picks up his courage, and tells this old lady, stop killing the child. Because we have been told by my teacher, that the boy child and the girl child are equal. One tight slap he got. He goes back, he comes back, there's a big gathering there, he picks up courage again, pushes himself as small as he was in class 7, goes up and says, please don't kill the child. He gets a slap on the left hand, the next cheek. He runs home. He doesn't give up. He doesn't give up. He goes home and complains to his mother what had happened and appeals to the mother saying, Mommy, can you come to me to my rescue? Today is Saturday, tomorrow is Sunday. Can you look after this child for two days? The mother is only for two days. And on Monday morning, come with me to school and hand over this child to my teacher, to my human rights teacher, and <laughs> she will look after the child. He had a very special mother who said yes. Usually the Indian mother would have given the third slap and said, mind your business. <laughs> this was a very special mother for a very special boy. He now goes with the mother to the old lady again and says, please, the child that you wanted to kill, don't kill. Hand over the child to my mother. She will look after the child on Saturday, on Sunday, and on Monday, my teacher will get the child and the teacher will look after. Human rights education is making the teacher the centrality of the piece. That is what I learned. I told you what my perception of a teacher was when I started. My perception of a teacher completely changed. And this boy was able to prevent. In the classroom, they had an exercise that came out and said, we will play hide and seek. And we will hide in houses where mothers are pregnant. And when the child is born, we will continue to hide if the child which is born in that house is a girl child to make sure the girl child survives. What a wonderful program that children could envisage. Mm. That the, the, UNICEF cannot, the UNICEF cannot envisage this. No. Yeah. The UN cannot envisage this, but the classrooms could. And I, I think that speak. was the tool that the children were getting engaged. And we can narrate stories after stories of how these inclusive exercises took place. We had to also back up ourselves as educators. Henry is not going to be respected in India as an educator. He is going to be respected in India as a troubleshooter. And that is what we are supposed to be. That is what we are mandated to be. That is a choice. Your choice is to lecture. My choice is to, to, to create havoc in society so that change comes up. But I had to back up a program of the sort with an advisory committee at the state levels and the national level. With academicians of a difference. So that the academic content was, was, was credited by an academic community. And the need for, therefore, the academia to be part and parcel of an engagement in schools. Very, very important. It is also trying, it is very important for us to back up with something which is progressive, seen progressive. My Prime Minister speaks one thing in Canada, one thing in New York, another thing in Washington, <laughs> another thing in, in, in London. And wherever he gets audiences that he is able to muster, he speaks different things and he comes out with slogans. Lots of slogans. One interesting slogan that my Prime Minister came out with was empower the girl child, beti bachao, beti padao. We picked that slogan because he is not interested in the girl child. He is interested in the slogan. 
We were interested in the girl child, so we picked up the slogan. And we started, while my bank accounts were closed, we took the slogan. And we backed the slogan with a program of human rights education for the girl child. But if you said human rights, human rights is a bad word in India. I was engaged with human rights when it was a bad word. I was engaged with human rights when it became a good word. I'm happy I'm still engaged with human rights when it's a bad word again. <laughs> <laughs> a, career, a career of several years. So we went back and we packaged our program as a girls' rights education program for boys and girls. <laughs> a girls' rights education program taught by women teachers, not by male teachers. Women teachers are more powerful because that is where they, they, what, what they have suffered comes out. And therefore, that is a tool that we used of using slogans to be able to push our agenda in. I think it is important also at a later stage in our education to look at citizens. And not only to look at children as children, but to prepare them later, just as they leave their schools, as well-prepared children, as well-prepared citizens, to face citizenship, to face that, that power of voting that they are going to exercise very, very soon. This is as regards our program in human rights education in schools, but we also engage with a variety of actors, in, with human rights defenders, and it is very important for us as working with human rights defenders to use a variety of methods of folk art, of campaigns, a variety of methods for human rights education to be taken. Forward. Thank you. Um, now, <laughs> um, so to conclude, Kimberly Vance, what about solutions, way of passages to progress? Great, thank you. Uh, and I want to pick up on a previous comment you've made about how restricted spaces of education can be um, private, public. But also, I mean, I, when I looked at this question, I thought we need to unpack the word education. Um, because for many in our communities, um, there's huge barriers around access to formal education um, through because of bullying, because of um, uh, disconnection from family or in fact expulsion from family. Uh, a lot in, in LGBT communities worldwide um, don't complete formal education and face huge barriers around that. So, so um, looking at sort of informal ways of learning are, are very important. And I'm going to highlight two sort of uh, extremes of the spectrum of education here in my examples. But um, we, we did a, a project, it was a while ago now, um, on uh, best practices for education and advocacy around human rights for L the LGBT community. It was a global project. We invited people to submit case studies and then we were going to do a publication of 10 and have them presented at an international dialogue in Argentina. Um, and we got over 150 submissions of case studies and we had to select down to 10, which was very difficult. But what was interesting is to, was to look at the breakdown of the kinds of case studies we got. And this is why um, understanding regional contexts is very important in terms of best practices around education. Because uh, almost exclusively, the case studies that we got from Europe and North America fell into three categories. One was educating policymakers and, and lawmakers. Um, the second was doing education in the schools, so anti-bullying programs and things like that. And the third would, was actually training people in the global south, <laughs> um, so delivering training to them uh, as partners. But none of our global south submissions dealt with any of that type of, of uh, education and learning. So uh, those applications dealt with uh, working with corporate partners. Because when your government is not an option, uh, and we have to acknowledge the huge power of, of, of multinational companies and corporations, uh, almost more power than governments in some of the countries we work with. Oh, it's gone dark. Um, <laughs> that's the corporations. <laughs> um, so working with those corporate uh, identities, some of whom, if they, if they have their home bases in North America and Europe, are, are more bound by those kinds of laws and regulations. Um, 
educating mass media. Mass media is huge in, in a lot of the countries that we work with. It's becoming like newspapers and stuff are becoming a thing of the past here in, in Canada and North America, but not so in, in many, many countries. Um, and and building internal leadership and literacy around human rights. So that was sort of how those things broke down. And so I'm going to sort of highlight two extremes of that. One, I'll talk about a project that we've worked on, and I mentioned it a few minutes ago, which is the Joe Jakarta Principles. And so this was a project that we undertook um, uh, 11 years ago now. They were launched in 2006. Um, to, and actually, the, the Joe Jakarta Principles, uh, Canada has a unique role to play here because the, the conversation around developing these principles was uh, initiated by Louise Arbour, who, who had become the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the time, who met with a group of us in Geneva who, who were having an international dialogue there on, on sexual orientation and gender identity and said, look, here's the deal. It's like a patchwork quilt of international law. And because it's a patchwork quilt, countries get away with saying there's no precedent here. There's no, these aren't universal rights. These, so you need, to, you need to sort of find it and bring it all together in something that makes sense. And so that was the, form, that was the foundation which led to this expert meeting which developed these, these principles, which articulate very clearly um, the obligations of countries under international law around issues of sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, I'm proud to say that just last week we launched the YP plus 10, which is uh, an additional set of principles 10 years later that reflect evolution in international law, evolution in concepts around gender expression and sex characteristics, um, uh, with nine new principles, a lot dealing with information technology, medical abuses, um, migration, rights of refugees, um, uh, and also 111 <coughs> state obligation, new state recommendations. And there will be a whole curriculum that kind of rolls out of these principles. So that's, that's the kind of more formal legal thing. But the more fun story to tell <laughs> is in this process of these, uh, welcoming these case studies, we got a case study from Eastern Europe from an organization that, ha that identified that the key problem for them in terms of any human rights advocacy was that their population didn't actually see them as human beings. They thought they were like scary monsters. Right? And so they actually developed a whole program. They spent a year on this, saying, how can we get into the minds and hearts of people on an everyday basis? We have no budget. Um, you know, how are we going to do this? How are we going to humanize our communities and population? We are going to get a contestant on who wants to be a millionaire. This was a huge show in Eastern Europe at the time. They had adopted the American model. Um, everybody watched this TV show every night. And it was very interesting because you had the contestants, but right behind the contestants sit their partners or significant others. Um, and they interact with them throughout the show. Um, you're also allowed to call out to friends and family for help on any of the questions. They spent a year <laughs> learning question, learning trivia, learning and getting one person, this one woman, through the process of becoming a contestant on this game show. And she, she was successful. Um, so she got a spot on the game show. She actually, I, don't, I forget how, how much money she won was not, I don't even think that was in the story. But um, every night into people's TV, this is free education. Um, there was her and her partner sitting right behind her, and they'd chat, and they'd be just like everybody else, sitting in your living room on a Saturday evening, talking about really boring, mundane things. And when she had to call out to friends, she'd go, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call out to my friend who works with this advocacy organization, and they really, uh, they really know their stuff, and I'm sure that this is an answer that they could provide." It was fascinating. She had us like totally entranced with this story. And it was brilliant. It was a brilliant strategy. And I'm sure everybody, you know, sitting in, in t watching television yeah. thought that this was just a fluke. But like the Rosa Parks story, which we all know was not just an accident, um, you know, there was a concentrated effort to make this a strategy and a plan and to works. use the mass media free uh, <laughs> to, to humanize uh, a population that was kind of being 
thought of as monsters. Um, great, great and so I like great to tell story. that story. It's a it's great really story. Yeah, thank story. you. And it, it just says how you have to think outside of the box. Yes. And, uh, and not, you know, say this is the mass media, they're against us, we can't access them. Mm -hmm. So it's a great story. Mm -hmm. So now, the questions. We are there, and um, I will read the top question, as you told me, is the one that was asked more. So 13 uh, people in the room have asked this question. So please be short in your answers because, yeah, I know it's difficult, but we, we don't have that much time and we want to have the maximum. What is artist? Building self-pride and empowerment in minorities or convincing the entitled majority to share what they perceive as theirs only, as theirs only. I'm sorry, my English, uh, is it clear for you? Um, Peut-être uh, Monsieur Crépeau qui est là-dessus. Donc, qu'est-ce qui est le plus dur? Uh, L'un ou l'autre, vous avez parlé de la minorité, de la majorité, là, construire la minorité ou, ou demander à la majorité de... de, 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 de d'étendre les droits humains, finalement. Pour ce qui est des migrants, et je parle seulement des migrants, c'est certainement la deuxième option. C'est de convaincre la majorité de les considérer comme des êtres humains à part entière avec des droits. Les migrants eux-mêmes euh, ont migré pour donner un avenir à leurs enfants, à leur famille, à leur communauté. Euh, pour créer un avenir pour eux-mêmes, mais dans bien des cas, pour toute la famille. Quand on voit, par exemple, quand j'ai rencontré des jeunes Afghans de 15 ans en Italie qui essayaient de rejoindre l'Allemagne et qui venaient de passer un an et demi à traverser euh, à pied, en camion, etc., de l'Afghanistan jusqu'à euh, la Grèce, euh, euh, l'Est de la Grèce, pour essayer de passer en Italie, euh, ils ne le font pas pour eux. Ce n'est pas, pas venu d'une décision euh, un jour de se dire « tiens, je voudrais aller en Allemagne ». Euh, c'est pas comme ça que ça se fait. Il y a une famille qui souffre, il n'y a pas d'argent pour élever les frères et sœurs, etc. Quelqu'un doit faire quelque chose. Et donc, ils sont des héros dans leur famille. Ils, nous, je veux dire, « they have the moral high ground », pas « nous ». Ils sont des héros dans leur famille, comme dans bien d'autres familles dans l'histoire. Les enfants de réfugiés, les petits-enfants de réfugiés, aujourd'hui, célèbre la mémoire de ceux qui ont le courage de se déplacer, de fuir, de bouger. Et ça, ça c'est un, ça c'est es, essentiel. Nous n'avons pas le haut du pavé là-dessus. Nous les considérons comme des criminels. Il faut absolument que nous changions notre attitude parce que eux vont cont continuer à avoir comme objectif de soutenir leur famille, comme nos ancêtres l'ont fait, à tous. Exact. Euh, je demanderai à Madame. Euh, merci. Je demanderai à Mme Vance, uh, I would ask you to answer this, convince the majority or, or uh, building self-pride and empowerment in minorities. What would you favor? What what's, is the hardest? I, I find that difficult to answer. I find that hard to answer um, because I actually think they're both difficult, uh, especially for the communities that we work with. Um, and I'll, let me just illustrate an example. So we worked for many years with a group in Peru Uh, who um, was very actively engaged in the regional and international human rights mechanisms, doing lots of fantastic and excellent work um, and uh, normative kind of work. And um, at one point, they kind of fell away. They went quiet for a while. And I remember reaching out to, to the woman who ran the organization, and I'm like, what, what's, uh, you know, what's happening? Is everything okay? Or, I haven't seen you in any of these spaces. And she said, you know what we realized? We, we set out thinking that our work, our main work, was these guys, you know, the people that we perceive as uh, needing the education um, with the power. And she said, and what we realized is that as we were starting to make some normative gains, our communities weren't claiming them. And we went back to a model of consciousness raising and small, low-scale workshops uh, and really building self-esteem and, and pride in our communities. Um, and that's what we felt we needed to do because we were not seeing the results of some of the normative gains that we had made. So probably both. Exactly. One after the other or one with the other. Yep. I have a question for you, Mr. Tiffane, especially for you. 
Uh, in teaching children to act, how do you balance the potential risk children may face in advocating for human rights with the potential gains? Risk versus gain. So when you're teaching, how do you balance both? Like this little kid who was trying to protect this, this baby. How do you balance the potential risks for children with the, the gains? This is what we are always asked. You are engaged in human rights education with children. Where does this whole question of teaching them responsibility start? Authorities love asking these questions. Because this is the only way they can put down the whole importance of a rights-based rights education. I think um, to, to be able to answer this, it is important to realize that in the classroom is an engagement that continues. It's an engagement on values which are the basis of our human rights. We are not dispensing a dispensing machine there talking about Article 1 and Article 7 and Article 21. We are talking about what exactly Professor spoke in the first leg of his presentation about stereotypes, about prejudices, about aspirations, and the basis, basic value behind each of these articles that we are talking about. And therefore, there is no question of looking at what is the risk in this. Because that is exactly what the child has to be told. The child has to be freed. The child is not free when, it, when she comes, when he comes to the classroom. And human rights education is that engagement which frees the child being able to engage deeply in the process of education. And you find that students who have actually gone through this course really come out very successful in their academic pursuit because they are fuller persons, they are strengthened persons, they are empowered persons, and I think that is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Crépeau, Monsieur Crépeau, la politique internationale migratoire de l'Union européenne et des Nations unies ne contribue-t-elle pas à la violation, voyons, à la violation des droits et à nourrir les germes de la division? Question difficile Non. Non Très la, bien. La, la réponse est oui. Parfait. Merci. <rire> Parlons franchement. Ah oui. Parfait. Peut-être quand même pour élaborer oui, un oui, peu. Oui, oui, un petit peu, un petit peu quand même. On ne pas m'arrêter là. Euh, je voudrais juste donner l'exemple de ce qui est en train de se passer en Libye. L'Europe ayant vécu des arrivées massives de personnes qui n'avaient pas de documentation pour rentrer en Europe à partir de 2012-2013, avec l'été de Marine Nostrum en 2014, l'été allemand en 2015, l'accord avec la Turquie, euh, a mis en place des mécanismes de blocage des flux migratoires dans d'autres pays. L'accord avec la Turquie fait que la Turquie bloque les gens sur le territoire turc pour les empêcher de passer vers l'Europe. Des accords avec la Libye fait que des gens sont bloqués en Libye, sont arrêtés et détenus dans des « hell holes » en Libye et euh, sont maintenus là à la demande et avec l'argent de l'Union européenne. Euh, et aujourd'hui, on a appris cette semaine, parce qu'il y avait un sommet entre l'Union européenne et l'Afrique, on a appris qu'à la demande du président Macron, l'Europe va diriger un, une opération de secours des migrants qui sont détenus en Libye de manière à ce qu'ils puissent tous rentrer chez, rentrer chez eux en toute sécurité. C'est exactement ce que souhaitait l'Europe dès le départ. L'Europe souhaitait qu'on qu les renvoie chez eux, et puisque la Libye ne le fait pas et s'occupe simplement de les arrêter et de les, de les maltraiter pendant des, des, des mois de, de détention, eh bien l'Europe va arriver au secours de ces gens-là et s'assurer qu'ils rentrent chez eux et qu'ils ne viennent pas en Europe. Je veux dire, on a des politiques migratoires qui créent les conditions de précarité qui font que les gens sont exploités. Il n'y a pas eu de euh, problème de passeurs de migrants entre la France et l'Italie depuis le début de la zone de Schengen, parce qu'il n'y avait pas de contrôle aux frontières. La France a rajouté des contrôles aux frontières à, à la frontière de l'Italie il y a un an à cause de la crise migratoire, et tout de suite, dans la semaine, 
les passages dans les Alpes euh, ont été rouverts et les passeurs ont commencé à faire de l'argent. Dans les années 50 et 60, des millions d'Africains et de Turcs sont rentrés en Europe. Il n'y avait presque pas de passeurs. Personne ne mourait en Méditerranée parce que tout le monde pouvait avoir un visa ou n'avait pas besoin de visa et tout le monde pouvait acheter un billet de, de ferry, de traversier pour aller en Europe. À partir du moment où on crée des frontières entre des gens qui ont besoin de venir et des marchés de l'emploi qui ont besoin de travail précaire, on crée un marché souterrain criminel. Et nous le savons. Or, les États augmentent la, la dureté des frontières et subventionnent les réseaux de passeurs, les réseaux de trafiquants. Donc, la réponse est oui. Merci. Merci pour votre attention. A question for you, Kim. Parents have the right to remove their child from classes discussing gender and sexuality. How can we counteract this and reinforce human rights education? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Uh, well, I mean, in, in, in the Canadian context, you have to work with the, the provincial authorities to do that and to um, basically not allow parents to have Uh, the ability to to sort of opt out of certain portions of the curriculum wasn't it done in Ontario? Um, she, I think the pri the premier. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the Ontario the the new. I think it's fairly new the proposed yes, yeah. the, program the new, here. Uh, the new sexuality program. Yeah, I yeah. Think. Um, but I do know the specific example I'm referring to is in Alberta. Um, Um, but I don't think this is unique to Canada. I mean, I think anywhere where there's sexuality education, comprehensive sexuality education. I mean, one of the things that we try to do is actually articulate what the UN says about comprehensive sexuality education, which is fairly good. Um, uh, there's some good references in there. And uh, even like the Child Rights Committee has also commented on the rights of children to have comprehensive sexuality education. So to, to actually have... The, the authority to remove someone from the classroom is denying them the right to have that comprehensive education. So, I mean, it's possible, actually, that someone could bring a claim against uh, a province or an area where they were allowing uh, people to opt out uh, of certain aspects of the curriculum. Um, you know, that, that's a possibility. I don't know. I haven't seen any move that that's going to be a way that people counteract it. I think probably the best solution is a local solution um, to work directly with the governments or the school boards that may be allowing that to happen and to remind them that actually it's, it's, fine. it's a violation, it's, it's a denial, it's actually from the perspective of the children it's a denial of their ability to learn about their own bodies and their own uh, development over time. Um, uh, so, so thank you, I'm pretty sure in Ontario Mm -hmm. uh, the Premier has, you know, with the new uh, classes of sexual education, mm -hmm. she has said it's for everybody and it's for mandatory, it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. And it has drawn some criticism, yes. but she stayed with it. Yep. And, and on this question of, of, um, of taking actions, mm -hmm. it's not exactly the same, but some mm -hmm. uh, um, Jewish um, uh, people who were denied mm -hmm. education have gone to court yeah. exactly on that. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think uh, there are, uh, there are possibilities. And another question, yep. maybe? Okay, so this one here. Um, even when human rights law protects gender and sexuality rights, do I have time or just one last one? Uh, so even when uh, human rights law protects gender and sexuality rights, young people, and other vulnerable people have unequal or little access. Mm -hmm. How do you uphold rights for youth? Who wants to answer that? Free <laughs> choice. choice. But I think only one can answer considering our time constraint. Kim. Two. Two, uh, okay. All right. Two can okay. answer. Go, go, go. They're both pointing to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. This came up in a workshop that I was in the other day, too. Not particular to gender and sexuality, but particular to a whole range of rights that in human rights education, when you're talking to children about an entitlement to these rights and you know that they actually don't have the ability to exercise those rights. The government won't allow it, the climate doesn't allow it, and how do you bridge that, that disconnect? Um, and I think it's the same thing, you know, how do you bridge that disconnect knowing that um, actually um, the climate around them doesn't allow the full exercising of those rights. 
Um, part of it is sort of talking in the frame of global citizenship and sort of making sure that teens and youth know that beyond their immediate surround, and this is a good age to talk about this. With children, it's harder because their immediate surroundings, family, religion are so important that if you do, if you do any kind of education that counteracts what are those messages. Teens, it's a little bit easier because they're starting to <laughs> develop, and I know this because I'm parenting two of them right now. <laughs> they develop a lot of more independence and ability to critically analyze and the ability to kind of think beyond what their parents and perhaps their direct communities are saying. And that's why I think it's really important um, both to have the curriculum that reinforces this entitlement to rights, but also to be able to point them to organizations that work on the implementation of those rights. Um, they kind of have to go hand in hand. And it, it's part of an education, I think, prerogative that you can't just educate about the rights without also building the capacity of organizations that work towards the implementation of those rights. Um, so pointing them to local LGBT youth projects. And if there's none where you are, find them from somewhere else and make sure they have access. But I've, I've, I do find that one of the benefits of the globalized world now is that almost anything's available on the internet. A lot of it's really crap, but um, for LGBT populations, the internet has been a bit of a savior, I'd have to say, because yes. it's, it's very hard now to sort of, if you live in a rural area and you think you're the only person, you really only have to get on the internet to realize you are not. Um, and so the internet has been a very valuable tool for rolling out programs around advocacy and education. So I want to all of us to thank you so much for this extremely interesting panel. Very interesting. And I will give the last word to no, Mr. It, Tifang, but it is, it, we'll is just, it is just to say that a lot of material that people were asking is going to be put into documents and they would be able to get it in the, in the app that our friends have prepared. Exactly. I think you will have, um, you know, what, what we referred to will be on, uh, on uh, your website, on the website of Ikitas. On the, on the app. On the app. On the app. Yeah. Okay. And thank you so much. Uh, this was a great start. Good luck with the panels, and I'll let you continue. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup à tous nos panélistes. Merci, Kimberly Vance, Henri Tifang, François Crépeau, ainsi qu'à notre modératrice, Julie Méville Deschaines. Merci encore une fois. Et on vous remet un petit cadeau en guise d'appréciation. Merci. You were very good. You should not have asked to speak last. You are very good. But I know how you feel. It's from McGill. Yeah.